Thank you. The question that uh, was asked, how does uh, Mr. Baker justify a one-year pay increase uh, that would cover the cost of health insurance for 250 hourly employees the Lucky Friday? Will Baker's compensation continue to increase at this rate in 2017 and beyond? I, uh, I will tell you that the Board of Directors is responsible for executive compensation, Mr. Baker's in particular, that we take that very seriously. We have spent a lot of time, along with our advisors, designing and maintaining and measuring <coughs> compensation with the goal of making certain that HECLA can attract and retain the best people in the mining industry. So we expect to do that. The second thing I would say is that these compensation programs are highly adaptive to set goals and the company's performance. In other words, they have a significant amount of pay at risk. If the company doesn't perform, if it doesn't even meet its productivity goals, if it doesn't meet its shareholder return goals, then their compensation will fall. So their compensation is going to be variable based on their improvements, the company's improvements, and the results. Um, to give you a third view of that, this 2017, our competitive return, total shareholder return, when you look at a number of peers in the, in the mining industry, was very good. We were toward the top of that and have been for the last several years, and that gets reflected in the compensation program. If we are competitive, we're having results. And the last thing I will say is that, as Michael just covered a minute ago, we actually have our shareholders vote in an advisory way on our compensation programs, and this year, that shareholder vote was strongly supportive of our compensation. So I and the board are very comfortable with our programs and with the results of that for our key executives. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Ted. Okay, um, I'll start with, uh, there's a question from Bruce Barabee, um, and thanks so much for uh, asking questions. I, I you know, appreciate it and I appreciate the opportunity to answer and you know, have, a, have a dialogue. Um, so the question is, there are literally millions of dollars of equipment that are in storage that were bought and not used. Hoist, pumps, and loaders are part of the list. Are these example of responsible spending of shareholder dollars? You know, and I guess, I guess what I would say that is a couple of things. I guess the first thing that I would say is, and it sort of ties in with you know, the innovation, right? We're gonna, we're gonna spend money and we're gonna, we're, we're gonna test things out and we're gonna, gonna try and see if we can improve productivity, improve the way we operate. Um, we're, not, we're not afraid of making an error in, in spending on some things. Um, and, I, and that's part, I think, of the culture of Hecla where there has been that, you know, the company has allowed that to happen where on occasion you go, geez, that was not a very good um, expenditure. But you learn from it. Um, and I'll give you an example. We built a shaft in Venezuela 2005, right? And that was a mistake, big mistake. And you know, we, we did not get a return on that in investment. Um, but when we came to build the shaft at the Lucky Friday, and in part, it wasn't a good investment. There's, you can sort of parse it lots of different ways, but the one in Venezuela, um, we went over budget, what, four times, I think, is that, does that sound about right? Um, so when we built the four shaft, we said, by God, we're not gonna do that again. We're gonna, we've learned from that, we're gonna make sure that this, that we control the cost of the four shaft. And so George, uh, took charge of that and, and George, we came in very close to budget on, on that within you know, certainly 5% of, the, of the, the budget on that project. And that was the biggest capital project in the history of the company. Um, so that's one thing I'd say. The second thing I'd say is, and I'll use, uh, I'll use the service hoist at the Lucky Friday, um, Claire, and I have talked about that over the years that he's been, been here. And the service hoist is something I think will add lots of value ultimately to the Lucky Friday, but it comes at a cost of putting that, that in 
that when prices were higher, we could afford to do it. Prices at the level they are now, we're not able to do it. So we've got that sitting to the side for another another day to to install that uh, that service hoist. So those are those are really some of the reasons why you end up having some things that you would like to to see generate value and uh, and and they don't. Okay, next question is from Paul and Lisa Sala. Um, the Lucky Friday future depends on two shaft remaining operable for the next 20 years, 20 or 30 years. It has been in terrible shape for years and without it, the Lucky Friday can't operate. Are there plans to replace it in order to protect shareholder investment? I guess two things is we recognize the need to continue to invest in that two shaft to assure the Lucky Friday is functioning. And so we've been, uh, I guess, Larry, for three years now. We've had a pretty steady crew um, on that two shaft to, to repair it. And it's going to be an ongoing process. And whether it, we ever are able to move away from that continuous repair, I don't know. This is a wood line shaft that was built in roughly 1960. So it's, it's been around a long time. Do we have plans to do a new hole in the ground? The answer is no, but I don't tell this very often, but one of the things I want to do before I retire from Hecla is build a new hole in, in the ground. Now, we have no justification for that. No, there's no um, way to do it at this point. We, I think we need to have exploration success at the Lucky Friday, particularly um, laterally, not, not deeper. We need to find mineralization. So I'm hoping that when we uh, get back underground and, and, and expand the exploration program, that we have success exploring to the west of the Silver Fault, or maybe there's success going to the east uh, on like the 40 vein or the 120 vein or, or some of those other vein. Or maybe it's something completely different from, from those things. But I'm hoping that at some point we're able to actually put a new, new shaft, or maybe it's a tunnel, right? I, you know, there was a few years ago when we were contemplating the four shaft. We actually there was a study done on, on a tunnel. It'd be a really long tunnel, and it's probably not viable. But boy, it sure is appealing to have a tunnel that's cutting across all of that ground, and and creating platforms for the exploration. So that's, that's sort of in my vision of what I hope could, could occur. Um, this is from Lisa Sala. Um, with the conventional mining drill blast muck at the Lucky Friday, ground stresses are relieved by, at blasting. The vast majority of rock bursts are with rounds, this de-stressing the ground and thus de-stressing the ground and improving safety. How do you plan to de-stress the ground with the continuous miner? How do you gain the trust of miners so they are confident they won't be in a catastrophic rock burst? Well, the first thing I'll say is I'm, not, I'm no expert, so, so I will, will allow you to you know, talk to Mark Board, um, who is an expert on this, and I'm sure he can, can talk to you in a, in a way. Um, you know, Lisa, you as an engineer, you guys can, can um, can figure that out or he can, he can explain that to you. But the bottom line is whatever mining systems we do at the Lucky Friday or at any of our operations, the number one concern is the safety of the employee. And everything we're doing when we think about all of this innovation is how do we make it safer? In some respects, how do we remove the miner from the most hazardous place they can be. And generally speaking, that's going to be at the, the face of wherever they're working. So how can we remove them from the face so they're not subject to the, the risks? So whether it's the continuous miner or it's, it's the automated LHD and the automated bolting and, and, and jumbo, whatever it is, it's how do we get people away from the, the face? And that's really what's driving uh, all that that, uh, that innovation that we're looking at. There's sort of a follow-on question that I'll, that, 
that Lisa has. Innovation and technology are excellent to introduce if it can be done in a tested and proven safe manner. Uh, there also needs to be economic advantage to implementation is there. And I think you can see from the presentation, in some cases it's quite clear the economic advantage. Some places it's a little murky. And we're, you know, we're working through what, what's going to generate a return, what's not. In some cases, if it's just going to be safer, you, you don't worry about the return. You're, you're going to make those, uh, those investments. So the wi fi at Greens Creek, there was no um, return that we could envision on that from the immediate in implementing the Wi-Fi and, and, the, and the detection system. We did that anyway, even though, even though there wasn't a return for it. And then uh, the last question we have is from Rick Norman. And, and Rick, I have to tell you, I've over the last few months, I've gotten to read some of the stuff you've written. You're a great writer, very articulate, uh, and appreciate that. And this is, is as well. Um, before Hecla's unfair labor practices instigated the current strike, members of 5114 worked for nearly 11 months in good faith under the terms and conditions of a previous agreement that expired in April 2016. During that time, production levels remained high. In Baker's, in my own words, the 3.6 million ounces of silver produced at the Lucky Friday were the most in 16 years. Production in the first months of 2017 prior to the labor dispute was also impressive. So rather than provoking a labor dispute, why didn't Hecla continue to honor the status quo and negotiate again when the new mining system is proven to be safe, reliable, and productive. Well, um, realize that we had 27 meetings with the union. We had a federal mediator come in to try to get the parties to come together, and we were unsuccessful at, at doing that. And we continued to meet, and we continued to negotiate, and we never got to the point where there was a meeting of the minds. So eventually, after we gave our best offer, after we got, gave our last best and final offer, we reached impasse. And when you reach impasse, then things change. Um, there is, it, it was at that point that we implemented what we had proposed. And, and so that's, Short and sweet, exactly where we we ended up, and why we why we had to do the implementation. We were at impasse, uh, and then subsequently, you guys, or maybe simultaneous with that, there was the strike. Um, so, that's uh, that's the response to that. Now, I think I've probably gone over exceeded my time, um, so I'll hand the meeting back to to Ted. Thank you.